Welcome to this um, examination techniques presentation for C5, uh, indirect taxes. Uh, my name is uh, Bestin Manyika, and I'll run through uh, you to uh, indirect taxation. And uh, first and foremost, I'll look at the introductory part of uh, this uh, subject. Uh, C5 indirect taxation introduces students to indirect taxation. Uh, which mainly covers uh, most of uh, uh, the aspects of value-added tax, uh, customs and excise duties and surtax. So this presentation is aimed at uh, helping students having challenges in passing the paper. Some candidates failed not because they did not have the knowledge of the subject, but simply because they were not uh, well equipped with the necessary skills in answering questions in the examinations. I hope this presentation will be of great benefit to those uh, preparing for C5 indirect taxation. Then I'll take you to the syllabus overview, which is uh, basically a summary of what is contained in C5 indirect taxation. Now, unit one, I'm going to talk about uh, value added tax. And in unit two, I'm going to talk about uh, specific sector value-added tax. And in unit number three, I'm going to talk about customs and excise duties. And unit number four, I'll talk about export concessions. Now, I'm going to look at the competencies in value-added tax. Upon a successful completion of a study of C5 indirect taxes, students should demonstrate the following competencies. Number one, they should be able to explain the meaning of value-added tax and how it works. So to start with, what is value-added tax? Value-added tax is an indirect tax as the impact or incidence of tax falls on different persons. And basically, this is the final consumer. Now, we are also going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about the arguments uh, for value-added tax and against value-added tax. There are people who propose probably that value-added tax is not a good tax. And there are those who are for it. So first and foremost, I'm going to look at the arguments against it. One of the benefits of value added tax is that it is invoice based or driven, meaning that it is uniform and uncomplicated. Secondly, VAT is beneficial to those suppliers who are registered for value added tax because they can claim their input tax, in other words, tax which they incurred at the time or point when they purchased the goods. So for those suppliers who are registered, it is quite very beneficial because whatever they spend or whatever input in terms of costs that they incur, they will have to claim it back. Unlike those who are not registered for VAT. Point number three. Value added tax is internationally proven. It has been proved by developed and developing countries as a way of raising revenue for the government. Number three, value added tax has also increased the tax base 
for revenue collection for the government. And therefore, from the time VAT was introduced on 1st July 1995, the government has observed an increased revenue uh, collection. That's why it has to continue. Number four, value added tax has a self policing nature, meaning that it enhances compliance. Why? Because the output tax for one person becomes the input tax for another person. And therefore, it is very difficult for anyone to evade or avoid VAT. Number six, value added tax has also increased the tax base for the government and thereby increasing revenue collection. Those are some of the arguments supporting value added tax. But of course, I'll also talk about some of the arguments against it. There are some people in some circles who feel that value added tax is not a good tax. But otherwise, um, the arguments against cannot outweigh the benefits which value added tax provides. And one of the, probably the arguments that, have, that has been advanced by some people in certain circles of this world are that, number one, VAT is a regressive tax. And what it means by a regressive tax is that it is a tax which charges higher taxes as the income reduces or lowers. Putting it the other way around, it is a tax which charges lower taxes as the income goes up or increases. Secondly, value added tax has been claimed to be one of those taxes that is very difficult to comply with because of the records that need to be maintained, especially small businesses have challenges who do not maintain accurate or adequate accounting records. And for that reason, they believe that it is a very complicated tax. So basically, those are the two arguments which have been advanced against the value-added tax. But as I said earlier on, these, these uh, detriments or disadvantages cannot outweigh those of the benefits that I've already talked about. The third point about VAT, which the students need to be aware of, they should be able to determine the taxable supply of goods and services. It's so amazing sometimes to find that students can't even define what a taxable supply is all about. But it's simple as a taxable supply is a sale of goods and services by a taxable supplier. And who is a taxable supplier? A taxable supplier is any supplier who is registered for value added tax. In other words, this is a person who supplies goods and services on which value-added tax is charged. That is a point number three. And point number four, it is also important for a student or candidate to be aware of the VAT registration and also 
deregistration. When you should do a trader register for value added tax? But before I go any further to look at the timings as to when a trader should register for VAT, let me also mention that there are two types of registration. The first one is called statutory registration, also known as the mandatory registration. For statutory registration, a trader needs to raise a turnover of at least 800,000 kwacha in order to be registered for VAT. And for those businesses who may not be able to attend or be able to generate the turnover of at least 800,000, then there is another opportunity by which they can be registered for VAT. Because the benefits arising from a VAT registered supplier are the same benefits one would get when someone is registered under voluntary registration scheme. Now, when should a business be registered for, for VAT? A new business can register for, for VAT when it commences trading. As soon as it commences trading, for as long as it is expected that their turnover will exceed 800,000 kwacha threshold, then they can register for VAT. But for those companies who were not eligible to register for, for VAT because they had not made a turnover of more than 800,000, then they can register for VAT as soon as their turnover reaches 800,000 in any 12 months period or 200,000 kwacha in every three months period. Now, I talked about uh, registration of VAT, which is of two types, statutory registration as well as the voluntary registration. Now, let me talk about also when deregistration can be effected, when a trader can be deregistered from VAT. Number one, a trader can be deregistered for VAT if he or she ceases trading permanently. You might have been providing taxable supplies, but eventually you find that you are no longer providing those services. Why? Because VAT is charged on taxable supplies. Or probably you were registered for VAT, but consequently most of your supplies become exempt supplies. Then your VAT can be um, cancelled. So that is the first point. The second point, when a business is sold, there's no re reason for you to keep the, the registration of VAT when you have uh, transferred the ownership of the business to another person. Which means that the person that is going to, uh, or the person that buys the business, will have to also initiate or have uh, his or her own registration. Number three, VAT can also be cancelled when there is a change in the legal status of the business. For instance, if a partnership has been dissolved, then registration can be cancelled. 
But of course, I'm not uh, also going to forget to talk about or to mention the fact that there are certain circumstances that may not render the consideration of VAT uh, uh, per se. And these are when there is a change in the trading name of a business or when they address change, changes or when there is a change in the location where the business is operating. Those matters will not render the registration of VAT, meaning that you still maintain your registration. The next item that I'm going to talk about is the meaning of a tax invoice. Value added tax is driven by an invoice, by the issuance of an invoice, meaning that every taxable supplier should provide an invoice to those that he or she deals with. But of course, we should also be uh, very much aware that uh, uh, VAT can be also be paid, paid according to the cash accounting scheme as opposed to the invoice uh, scheme. But the invoice scheme is the one which is a, uh, normally uh, used. The cash accounting scheme is not used by all the businesses, just a few businesses that use the cash accounting scheme, which means that under the cash accounting scheme, you only account for VAT when you have received or paid uh, the money. But when we talk about invoice driven, it means that as soon as you make a sale, you need to provide an invoice. And every trader who is a registered for VAT must provide a tax invoice to those or to whom he sells his goods and services. The only exception are those that are in the retail sector. There's a bit of an exemption for those that are in the retail sector, like the shops, the supermarkets, and name them. But any other business apart from those that are in the retail sector are required to provide a tax invoice. The reverse charge um, of VAT is something which was introduced by government uh, for non-resident suppliers who have not appointed an agent and have not paid the uh, tax. So, and therefore, the recipient of the goods is the one who is supposed to account for VAT and therefore must raise an invoice and pay VAT at 16%. Then number, last point, students also should be able to explain the VAT control and the credit checks. By nature, people are not honest in their dealings. To a certain extent, others may even manipulate the records and end up paying less tax than they are, they are supposed to pay. In taxation, we call that as the tax avoidance, or completely not pay tax, which is called tax evasion. Now, why is it necessary for VAT inspectors to visit organizations and check the records that are maintained by those organizations? It is important for these organizations in order for them to ascertain the correct determination of VAT payable and to see to it also that they are complying with the, the VAT Act. And that's why you see that VAT inspectors or ZRA inspectors will actually visit organizations randomly and they will go there to check the kind of records that are maintained. For instance, VAT records are very important, uh, such as uh, the cash book, the purchases day book, the sales day book, and also the VAT account. So if those records are not in place, then it becomes very difficult for those tax of officers 
authorities to be able to determine the correct amount of tax that you are supposed or a trader is supposed to, to pay. And that's why those checks from time and again are carried out by the ZRIA uh, officers. And some of the books which they have to uh, check or they need to check are the latest audited management accounts. They also uh, check the invoices, purchases invoices, sales invoices, and any other necessary documentation for the purpose of determining the amount of tax that is payable to Zambia Revenue Authority. On the next part of my talk on VAT, I'm going to also look at the obligations of the VAT registered trader. I earlier mentioned that there are two types of registration, statutory registration and voluntary registration. Now, let's take it that you have been registered for VAT or a trader has been registered for VAT. What are the obligations of a VAT registered trader? What does he ought to do after being registered for VAT? Because when you are registered for VAT, you'll be given the TP number, which is called the, 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 the personal identification number. Now, the first point that I'm going to talk about on the obligations is that a VAT registered supplier is supposed to provide taxi invoices to whom he does trading or does trading with. And I mentioned that the only, except, uh, the only exception are those that uh, operate in the retail sector. But the rest of the other traders they can actually demand for the tax invoice because it is the obligation of the trader to provide the tax invoice to those that he sells goods to. The second obligation is that since you have been registered for VAT and you have a VAT registration, therefore you are supposed to display your VAT registration certificate in a public area so that anyone can see that you are a registered supplier. Because there are certain organizations who do not want to uh, deal or do business with those that are not registered because it is costly. The VAT registered suppliers are better off if they do business with those that are registered. As I said, there is this input recovery of VAT um, uh, input. So meaning that the VAT that you paid when you bought the goods will be recovered again. And that's why there is this talk or debate that is going on that sales tax should be reintroduced and do away with the VAT. But remember what I said from the the benefits of VAT, that VAT is a worldwide tax. It has been internationally proven by both developing and developed countries. And therefore, it will be a drawback for a country like Zambia to get back to sales tax. Why? Because sales tax is a, is a bit complicated compared to VAT. Because in v, for VAT, you only need two rates standard rate of 16% and zero rate, just that. So in comparison between the two sales tax and, the, and VAT, we see that VAT is still a better tax and the government should go along with it. The other obligation of uh, a VAT registered trader is to submit VAT returns and pay tax on due debts. The due debt of the payment of VAT 
is the 18th of the following month. But of course, for other businesses, it is 16, especially those that, that make supplies to, uh, to the government, ministries and other, and, and other departments. Those are the ones that are required to pay by the 16th of the following month. For instance, the VAT for this month is supposed to be submitted by the 18th of the next month on the 18th day. Now, the other challenge which students have actually or face in answering questions on value-added tax are the computations of VAT payable and refundable. Over and over, as examiners, we have observed that uh, most of the students have challenges in making computations of VAT payable to Zambia Revenue Authority. But this is very simple. All one needs to do is to account for output tax. And output tax is tax on sales. And also account for input tax. And the input tax is tax on purchases. So, the difference between the output tax and the input tax is the amount of VAT payable to Zambia Revenue Authority, ZRA. It is payable to ZRA when the output tax is more than the input tax. But if the opposite applies where the input tax is greater than the, the output tax, then a trader should recover that tax. In other words, make a claim from Zambia Revenue Authority. Other areas where students should also uh, focus on with regard to VAT is listing transactions and purchase agreements. First and foremost, I'm going to talk about um, the meaning of a lease. What is a lease? The word, the word lease sometimes uh, confuses many people, but it's synonymous with renting. When you, when you lease an asset, it means you, you have hired an asset. You are renting an asset in exchange for rental uh, payments for the use of that particular asset. So, a lease is a contract between a lessor and a lessee. The lessor is the owner of an asset, and the lessee is the client or the tenant who has hired the asset. Because some businesses have problems to even acquire the, uh, they acquire assets. However, they have this opportunity to still acquire an asset by leasing it. So basically, there are two types of leases. And these are operating lease and finance lease. An operating lease is a short-term kind of a lease. In other words, it's defined as a lease other than a finance lease. And when you look at the characteristics of an operating lease, it's purely renting an asset for a given period of time. In other words, it does not transfer the risks and rewards of ownership of an asset to the lessee. But when you talk about a finance lease, a finance lease is a type of lease which transfers the risks and rewards of ownership to the lessee. So meaning that once an asset has been acquired by the lessee under a finance lease, therefore, that becomes like he or she owns an asset. 
and you can even claim things like uh, capital allowances you know from from such an asset why because ownership has passed from the lesser to the lessee now the most important as, uh, part of this uh, uh, area of the syllabus is to be able to know how leases are treated in VAT, how leases are taxed in relation to value added tax. So, and therefore, I'm going to describe the lease rental and uh, VAT on leases. So, when you acquire an asset, when you hire an asset or lease an asset, you cannot just uh, use an asset free of charge, and therefore, you actually be paying some consideration. And this consideration is what we call the lease rental. In the context of uh, value added tax, these rentals that are paid by the receipt are chargeable for value added tax. And therefore, a trader must be aware that uh, if they are going to acquire an asset on a, a lease arrangement, there is a component of uh, the lease rental, which uh, will be subjected to value-added tax. Now, on the same subject, uh, candidates or students should also understand the concepts of sell and, and lease back. This appears to be a bit more self-explanatory in the sense that you had an asset you decide to sell it to somebody else. And after selling that asset, you begin to rent it. That's why it is called sell and lease back. What is the aim of, of doing that? Businesses that are going through a financial challenge or cash flow problems, they can sell one of their assets under a sell and lease agreement arrangement so that they can raise money to ease their cash flow problems. So they will sell an asset, and after they have sold their, their, that particular asset, then they will begin to rent it again. And that's how it works. But in terms of VAT, uh, what effect does this have on VAT? I think that's the most important uh, point, which uh, students must uh, be aware of. Now, the... Rentals, as I said, which are paid in a sale and lease back, just like in a normal lease, are chargeable to value added tax. One has to pay VAT on those rentals, especially on the capital element. The other point that I should talk about on leasing is understanding the leasing of motor vehicles. Naturally, motor vehicles, they are not within the VAT um, um, umbrella, I would say that. Meaning that VAT on motor cars is not claimed as input tax. But for those businesses that have acquired these uh, motor vehicles under a lease agreement. Fortunately, if that is a business that they do, then they'll be allowed to claim for the input tax on these motor vehicles. Take your career prospects to the next level with Zika. Our diploma in accountancy is an essential qualification if you're planning on entering the accounting profession. The Zika tax program at both certificate and diploma level equips you with an enhanced understanding of the field of taxation. Our diploma in public sector financial management is ideal for accountants or trainee accountants working in the public sector. And CA Zambia, a respected designation designed to ensure that graduates are highly trained to hold senior positions in the workplace. You can study through flexible options like self-study as well as part-time or full-time through our accredited tuition providers. Zika sponsors the top CA Zambia graduate to the One Young World Summit for Young Leaders and also offers scholarships to the top university accountancy graduates from recognized universities. Visit zika.co.zm now for more information or find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. 
Don't delay. Your future awaits. The other areas of importance that uh, students must be aware uh, could be the specific sector value-added tax, where students should be able to explain the VAT considerations in the following sectors. I've also observed a number of challenges. Students have uh, a bit of problems when dealing with the, or answering questions on these specific areas on which VAT has uh, been introduced. So the government, to try and broaden the tax base, it has also brought into um, uh, the, the tax regime, you know, other areas uh, of, uh, of the economy. And uh, one of the areas where VAT um, should be talked about or should be looked at is in the mining area. Now, in the mining area, when a mining company sells goods or exports goods outside the country, naturally exports are zero rated. But if the mining company sells goods locally, then VAT at the standard rate of 16% shall be charged. That is in the mining sector. And the, even some of the services which are provided by by the mines. Like for instance, if a mine runs a hospital and it provides the medical uh, facilities or services, it will be subjected to value added uh, tax. I mean, those, sorry, those are, those are, those are, those are zero rated. But if they, if they incur other costs like electricity, you know, insurance and many other costs or internal costs, they will still be charged at 16%. Number two is the agricultural sector. The agricultural sector has enjoyed a lot of reliefs in terms of um, payment of tax. Though this is outside the indirect taxation, but uh, I would mention that uh, while other companies are taxed at 35%, the agricultural sector or any income that is a uh, and from the agricultural sector is only taxed at the rate of 10%. And on top of that, there are a number of um, reliefs such as, such as the capital allowances, which uh, a farmer would actually uh, get um, as a relief from the payment of, uh, of tax. Now, coming to value-added tax, now, uh, the, the most important thing is that um, in the agricultural sector, in terms of uh, VAT, the produce that are provided by the farmers in the agricultural sector are most of them at zero rate. They are zero rated, especially in processed foods. Processed foods will be taxed at a standard rate of 16%, but raw food, soybeans, uh, fresh, fresh vegetables, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and other agricultural goods, they are zero rated for value added tax. So, in short, what I'm saying is that most of the produce in the agricultural sector are taxed at zero. Then the other sector is the tourism sector. In the tourism sector, we see that, again here, most of the services which are provided by the tourism sector are zero rated for value added tax purposes. So if you go for, for elephant tour, uh, walking with the lions, you know, such services, they are zero rated for VAT. The other sector where the government is trying to raise revenue uh, through value added tax is the telecommunications uh, sector. 
in the telecommunication sector, most of the services that are provided in this area are taxable at a standard rate, which is 16%. So basically, the, telephone, the telecommunication sector is a taxable area in terms of value added tax. The last point on this is on the banking and the financial services uh, sector. With effect from 1st January 2011, most of the services that are provided by the financial institutions are liable for value added tax at 16%. A very good example are commissions on local bank drafts, commissions on foreign bank drafts, commissions on managers' checks, you know, excess withdrawals or commissions on excess withdrawals and other services. These are chargeable to VAT at a standard rate of 16%. Let me come to some of the areas of importance in as far as uh, customs and excise duties is concerned, where students should be conversant with the following areas. Number one, before I explain, functions of customs and excise division, powers of ZRA officers, determination of value for duty purposes, VDP, computations of customs, excise duties, and import VAT, especially on the importation of motor vehicles, and international aspects of customs and excise duties. The first point which students should be able to demonstrate in terms of their competencies is functions of the customs and excise division. So meaning that uh, VAT and, uh, in other words, VAT is under the direct taxes division and uh, customs and excise duty um, or customs and excise division, this is a division which uh, regulates uh, customs and uh, excise duties as taxes. So what are the functions of the customs and excise uh, division? Number one, which is actually obvious, is to raise revenue for the government. And the revenue is raised from a number of taxes that are charged on certain goods, both locally and those that are imported from other countries. The taxes that uh, are collected by this uh, division include the customs duty itself, which is levied on imported goods. Number two, fuel lev levy, which is levied on uh, petroleum products such as petrol and diesel. You also have the dumping tax, which was introduced to try and uh, protect the public from certain harmful materials. And this is one area where they are also uh, made sure that uh, no one should bring in uh, uh, pornographies. I think uh, our minds are very, very fresh from what is actually going on in the country or what has happened recently. Pornographic materials are, are not allowed. Or indecent uh, dressing or other harmful you know, uh, products and the services. Secondly, 
The other function of the customs uh, and excise div division is to prevent smuggling. Smuggling is a very common term, especially in the borders. When goods have been smuggled, it means they don't pass through the, the tax point. In other words, they, they are brought into the country without being taxed. And that is an offense. So that is one of the areas which the customs and excise duty uh, deals with. To make sure that all the goods that are imported into this country are chargeable to customs duty, excise duty, and VAT on imports. Then number three, function of the customs and excise division is, uh, is to provide statistical data to the government through its agencies, vis-a-vis -vis the Bank of Zambia and the Central Statistical Office, C CSO. And why, why, why is it important to provide the uh, 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 trade statistics to the government? That information is very important to the government because they need to plan. So, those are some of the functions of the customs and the and excise division. Then I also talk about the powers of ZRI officials. They are mandated by law to visit any company and seize sometimes documents as it is necessary for them to determine the amount of tax that is, uh, that is payable. So I talked about visitations that are made by the, by, the, by, by the ZRA officials. And when they come to your organization, they have that freedom or mandate and allow them to check the records that they actually need. So they, are, they have even the power to seize or confiscate any documents that, may, that they may feel is necessary for, for tax purposes. Item number four, students should be able also to demonstrate and be able to determine value for duty purposes. Why? Because customs duty is dependent on some value. And this value is called value for duty purposes. What is value for duty purposes? Value for duty purposes is the value on which customs duty is based. When you are calculating customs duty, excise duty and import VAT, these are charged on value for duty purposes. And it's important that the candidates are aware of how this value is determined. There are actually a number of methods that are used, but of course, amongst those methods, the most important one is the is a transac transaction value method, which is based on the price paid for the goods that have been acquired. But there are other methods besides that. And remember, the other method is uh, computed value, which is based on the, the cost of production, insurance, and the freight. The other one method is called residual or fallback method, which requires that you have to go through the other methods for you to be able to determine the value of goods and services. And for the other two are transaction value of identical goods, meaning that the price of goods that have been bought from outside the country will be dependent on the value 
of the goods that have been acquired outside the country from the same source. There is also the transaction value for similar goods. Similar goods means they are not exactly the same. So those are the methods I'll run through again. Transaction value for, for similar goods. Transaction value for identical goods. Computed value. And deductive value. Now the other area which is very important for for the, for, the, for the students is the computation of customs excise duty and import VAT, especially on the importation of motor vehicles. On the computation of customs excise duties and import VAT, especially for the motor vehicles, uh, many students, I think, uh, do not have uh, problems in this area, except uh, where they may use the wrong rates. But the majority of them, uh, they score very good results in this uh, part of uh, 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 the syllabus. So I didn't even give an example of uh, an exam type of a question in this area because most of them score very good marks in this area. And uh, lastly, on the customs and excise duties, let me just make a comment on the international aspects of uh, customs and excise duty. Zambia is a member of a number of uh, regional groupings such as COMESA, uh, Preferential Trade Area PTA, and um, does also subscribe to AGOA and many other bodies. So it has entered into trade agreements with other countries. And one of the aims of these bilateral agreements is to try and uh, mitigate the problem of double taxation where if the goods have been already been taxed from the country where they are coming from, then they should not be taxed again in Zambia or the other way, the other way around. Export concessions and the, under this area, students should be able to explain the jute drawback system and how it works. In particular, more attention should be paid to one, the meaning of duty drawback system. The duty drawback system is a support program which was uh, introduced by the government of Zambia. And what is the aim of this system or scheme? The aim of this scheme is to help the local manufacturers to try and recover the VAT that they incurred when they manufactured the goods. So there are challenges of duty drawback systems, of course, and one of the challenges is to provide actual information, you know, to the to the to the revenue authorities for them to be able to claim this uh, tax. So that's what the government of the Republic of Zambia did. For those traders or organizations that manufacture goods specifically for export, they are given this uh, privilege or opportunity to recover the tax on these, these uh, goods that have been produced uh, locally. And uh, this is calculated using a fraction which is called the coefficient for duty drawback uh, formula which is simply t over 1 plus, uh, 1 plus t. It's expressed as a percentage. So for one to be able to arrive at the amount of input tax that is claimable. Common mistakes that uh, I have observed, observed with many of the students that uh, I write this paper. especially in the area of value-added tax. One common mistake students make is the computation of VAT payable refundable, where they can not easily identify the deductible input VAT expenses 
from output tax. So earlier on I mentioned that what is payable to ZRIA is when output tax is more than the input tax. But the students sometimes they, they have challenges or problems to identify those uh, input uh, expenses where they should do compute the input tax which needs to be deducted from output tax. Especially where the trader is involved in exempt and zero rated supplies. They have challenges also to calculate or to compute the recoverable non-VAT input for the registered businesses that make both taxable and exempt supplies. And the majority of them can't even recall the formula that uh, it is taxable supplies in the period over total supplies made in the period multiplied by 100. And this percentage shall be used to determine the amount of uh, recoverable non attributable input VA, VAT. The other common mistakes observed in the area of customs and excise duties is failure to determine the value for duty purpose which I've already explained because some candidates can't differentiate between VDP and CIF CIF for meaning cost insurance and, the, and the freight and there's also wrong use of duty rates on new and imported uh, motor vehicles and also not understanding the difference between methods used to determine value added tax and the conditions which should be met when using the transaction value method. Now let me briefly talk about the examination techniques for C5 indirect taxes, how students should prepare themselves before and after the exams. But in an exam room or whenever they have been given a paper, what they ought to do. I will just run through a few points. Number one, one has to read the, 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 the requirements of the question. It's very important that you, a candidate reads the question carefully and understands what is required of him or her. And pay attention to some of the words like explain, list, state, define, describe, distinguish, calculate, and compute. Was where they are supposed to explain, they will describe or they will state. So it's important that students should understand the meaning of some of the verbs used by, by the examiners. So read the requirements and understand exactly whatever is required. Two, plan your answer because an answer based on a plan is actually much better than one in which that isn't. Make a summary of how you are going to tackle the question. And if possible, number three, you have to use uh, subheadings so that the examiner can easily identify the points that you have brought forward. Number four, start your question on a new page. But before that, let me look at it. Uh, you, you can start any question in an exam. There is this belief that... Uh, one has to start from the first question to the last question. No. In an examination, you start, those questions, start with those questions which you feel or believe are easier. And then end up with difficult questions. I think that has actually proven and worked very well you know, for those students who have followed this method. And time and again, we have said that uh, a candidate or student should start answering each question on a new page. Although this is not mandatory, but this can be of benefit to the marker to be able to identify the points that you have uh, put across. Continuing with the technique, students should not include irrelevant information. That will merely waste their time and the marker's time. I've seen that if the question has got two parts, A and B, and A is only carrying two marks, and B is carrying 18 marks. Now, because A is very simple, they will end up choosing that question just for the two marks. 
and blank on the, on the 18 marks. So the selection of questions sometimes is very, very critical. At a point when a candidate is choosing questions, you have to be very careful. Make sure that you have uh, or you are able to score the maximum number of, of marks. But you find that they are only labeling full page on only two marks and be able to bring forward all the points, you know, regurgitate everything that is unnecessary for the question. So students should also write neatly and legibly, legibly. The handwriting and the layout of uh, the answer must be clear so that the examiner can see what you have uh, put across. So students should also use spare time to read through the answers and make corrections. If they have that time, after they have written all the ex uh, questions, they can get back and go through whatever they have written to make sure that they have put across whatever they intended. So for numerical answers, use standard workings. If possible, use the performer that is provided by the examiner. And then show workings to support your main answer. So your main answer must be supported by uh, the workings. And I think that is a normal thing that one has to do, especially for computation um, uh, questions. And verify your computations for accuracy sake. Right, keep moving and don't spend too much time on one question. Other people, you find that they'll write uh, very few questions. They may not write all the questions necessary because they spent more time on one particular question, which probably, you know, uh, costed uh, uh, the other areas where they should have earned is marks. So keep moving and don't spend too much time on one question. So manage your time to ensure that you attempt all the required questions. So the chances of not passing the exams are very high when you do not attempt all the questions. So a candidate uh, who is likely to pass the exam is that who answers at least the majority of all the required questions in the examination paper. And finally, um, I gave an example of uh, an, an exam type of question on value-added uh, tax. Uh, just to expose uh, those uh, candidates uh, that have challenges on the computation of uh, value added tax. If you look at the solution to this question um, on VAT, it says the ABC PLC is a Zambian company that distributes cotton and other raw materials to blanket manufacturing companies, the company is registered for VAT and the following information has been extracted from the management accounts for the month of January 2019. Uh, you have the sales there, cost of sales, gross profit expenses, uh, depreciation, bad debts written off, general expenses, operating expenses and net profit. So exempt supply is taken as a proportion of total sales amounting to 10% and included in the remainder are zero rated uh, supplies of 18,750. 15% of standard rated sales were made to customers who are not registered for VAT. But of course, let me just go point by point. If you look at the first point, exempt supplies taken as a proportion of total sales amounted to 10%. Exempt supplies are not taxable for VAT and they are completely outside the VAT jurisdiction. Number two, 15% of standard rated sales are made to customers who are not uh, registered for VAT. This is taxable at the rate of 16%. Number three, included in the cost of sales are purchases totaling 94,200. These include exempt purchases whose value was 22,500. The remainder of the purchases are standard rated for value added tax. 20% of standard rated purchases are from non-value added uh, or VAT uh, registered uh, trader. Now purchases qualify as input tax. You can claim back your purchases. But uh, if you uh, sold to or you rather bought from the suppliers who are not registered for VAT, which means that you have no opportunity to claim the, the input tax, and then number four, 
The bad debts are written off on 31st January 2019. The figure consists of two invoices, 4875, in respect of the payment uh, that was due on 1st July 2017 and 1st December 2017. Now, students must be aware of how they must deal with uh, bad debts written off. Bad, re bad debts written off can be claimed for input tax as long as the debt or the bad debts have been outstanding for a period of not less than 18 months. So those invoices that have been outstanding for less than 18 months cannot be uh, claimed back as input uh, VAT. Number five, the general overheads are all standard rated supplies for VAT. There's no problem on that, which means that 16% is going to be charged on, on those overheads. The figure for operating expenses are inclusive of VAT at the standard rate and are made up of entertaining expenses. Entertaining expenses cannot be claimed as input tax. So applies with the petrol. No input tax is claimed from petrol. And on diesel, only 90% can be claimed. But of course, when the figures are inclusive of VAT, you use a fraction, or VAT fraction of 4, 4 over 29. So unless otherwise um, all the figures are VAT inclusive, then uh, you either extract VAT that has been incurred using a fraction of 4 over 29 and the rest will be at 16%.